The 19th century was the heyday of scientific racism against colonized animists all over the world. There are still remnants of superstition and ancient paganism deeply rooted in these people. It is an expression of infantile naivety. Peoples of nature have the imagination of children that animates everything. They generally believe that all the afflictions are caused by sorcery and everything in their surroundings is governed by invisible forces, the rivers, the sea, the trees, the mounds, the underground. Uh, this is likely caused by hysteria and mental deviation that leads to delusions, right? <laughs> now, anybody familiar with this history of cultural research will recognize this kind of discourse. Exactly this language has been used against indigenous peoples all over the planet and this judgmental denigration of other people's traditional animist knowledge has become a standard tool in the repertoire of colonial oppression, right? But here's the thing, Henning Feilbeer, that I was just paraphrasing here, he wasn't actually talking about a colonized people. He was talking about his own people. He was talking about the Dutes, the peasantry of Jutland, incidentally my own subgroup of the Danes, whose beliefs and practices he was studying. And the intense chauvinist rejection of the, in, in this case, a South Scandinavian animism is I identical with the kind of discourse that has been targeted at indigenous populations all over the planet in the same pe period. It is an identical discourse. Now, this is a video about the ongoing uh, persistence of how this colonial heritage uh, of oppression has been targeted specifically at Euro-traditional animist knowledge. <laughs> The Nordic Animism Channel is run by me, Dr. Rune Janne Rasmussen. I'm a cultural researcher, historian of religion. I'm educated from Uppsala and Copenhagen universities. And on this channel, I strive to popularize my research and initiatives on recovering North European traditional animist knowledge of land connectedness and kinship with the other than human world. And I try to make this overlooked part of our cultural history available for contemporary popular culture, self-image, spirituality, and eco-activism. You can Patreon support my work, or you can visit my webshop. This opening example here, it shows that when we talk about knowledge, it does actually make some kind of sense to talk about colonization and to use some of the decolonizing thinking also on Europeans, both Old World and Diaspora, your ascendants. Political and economic exploitation is still a little bit of a different issue, but when it comes to cultural knowledge, we are as colonized, perhaps in some cases more colonized, than many indigenous groups. Our traditional knowledge has been aggressively oppressed with exactly the same sort of chauvinist thinking which was dictated by elites and which was also targeted at colonized groups. There are even cases where this identification is explicit. For instance, comparing uh, European peasantry to African savages, uh, a comparison which achieves two things. It reinforces racism against the Africans while targeting the same bigotry at Europeans who fail to live up to the standards of whiteness, right? Because that is what this is really about. It is about whiteness. We were not supposed to be animists who experience rivers and mounds and trees as persons. We were supposed to be or we were supposed to be shaped into white people. And as white people, we were supposed to be rationalist, modern, nationalist and often Christian, right? And if some part of our traditional knowledge was lucky, then bits and pieces of it could perhaps be allowed to be reduced to nationalist stafage in the pageantry of, of this or that militant movement or state, right? But while this bigoted oppression is today being challenged when it comes to indigenous groups, it persists virtually unchallenged when it comes to Euro-traditional animism, the animisms of majority uh, Eurocentrics. Of all the different forms of indigenous knowledge or traditional knowledge in the world, there's one kind, one kind which is a position that is still excluded 
from a voice in contemporary academia, and that is Eurodescendant traditional knowledge. Why is that? Why is that? You know, I'm trying to communicate about the recovery of one kind of this traditional knowledge on this channel, the animist knowledge of my own part of the world, Nordic animism. But why is it that particularly Eurodescendant traditional knowledge is still faced with this oppressive structure, right? And also, why is this even important? Couldn't we just let it slip and say that, you know, water under the bridge, you know, folklore and animism, let it be a thing of the past, you know? And well, we could do that. But the reason that we shouldn't, I think, you know, the reason that it is important is, you know, that many do agree that traditional knowledge practices of indigenous groups are important, not only from their obvious cultural worth, but also because it's a kind of uh, knowledge that seems to hold keys for how to live in the world in ways that are somewhat less of an apocalyptically omnicidal attack on all life, you know, than our present consumer system, which is rooted in modernity. And this idea makes sense. At the end of the day, it's not the Maori or the Lakota who has driven the world to the brink of the biggest catastrophe in the history of life for 66 million years. It is us. It is the Euro-modern civilization, though of course today others are certainly also participating in this uh, project. But, you know, historically and predominantly, it's, it's a project of white people, basically. So uh, this idea would imply that we should all go and become Maori and, or Lakota, right? that might be a good idea, but there's a little thing there. And that is that the Lakota actually haven't issued an invitation to all the world's white people to go and become Lakota, and it's highly doubtful that they ever will. So at this juncture, all those eulogies about how important indigenous knowledge is for the survival of organized human existence, they usually just fizzle out. They end in some sort of nostalgic, resignating dream about how it might give a, a solution for our planetary clusterfuck if we could sort of kind of like become somehow like the Lakota, but without actually becoming Lakota. This is a cognitive dissonance, of course. Becoming Lakota-like, like, without actually becoming too Lakota-like. And this is why these debaters and authors and these platforms and conferences tend to end on these nonsensically abstract notes that never get nitty-gritty and concrete, but rather just throw out these general statements of how cool it would be if everybody were like somehow like somewhat more animist, right? Many of the contemporary calls to animism stay in the abstract. They stay somehow culturally detached, right? Particularly when to, uh, addressing your descendants. Animism is an ideal that we may aspire to, and scholars of the Anthropocene write this in their finalizing chapters of their books. You know, more animism could be kind of nice. But this is again is an absurd contradiction, because animism is the opposite of this detachment, you know, it's attachment. And it's the opposite of thinking and talking about abstract things. It is the doing of concrete things, you know. Some also resign into some sort of indigeneity, indi uh, idealizing where indigenous peoples are imagined as some sort of ideal state where some almost angelic, ever-wise sons and daughters of nature who live in a state which is forever out of our grasp, but, but which can be sort of worshipped almost. And this fetishizing is itself, I think, actually racially problematic, uh, but that's uh, it's kind of a different story. But here's the thing. What exactly is the reason that your de descendant traditional knowledge is not even allowed a voice in, in, in that category of indigenous uh, knowledge as a valid contemporary platform for thinking. You know, what, what, why? You know? And let me just start by saying that this exclusion is absolutely idiotic. Uh, because let me make this unambiguously clear. In spite of widespread notions in academia, in broad populations, in media, there are, and I cannot say this emphatically enough, there are I challenge anybody with half an education to try to counter this point. I challenge you, show me where and how the following is wrong. There are, 
zero methodological and zero analytical and if possible less than zero political and moral reasons that we should not engage the traditional animist knowledge traditions that is the heritage of those 2.3 billion white people the unquestionably most destructive 30 percent of the world's population this is important you know, so why the fuck is this academically dated, absolutely anachronistic, late 19th century colonialist oppression of our traditional animist knowledge still being upheld today, with some small amendments here and there, but generally virtually unchallenged? The reason is rooted in whiteness, protecting, reproducing and upholding whiteness, being white and what that is supposed to mean. And I just have to look a little bit at that uh, in order to explain it, because there's also some rather paradoxical stuff going on in here. Because whiteness and related nationalist constructions are relatively often built or bolstered with actually some kind of iconography of Euro traditionalism. But it's important to state that this is sort of a, one kind of, perhaps even a superficial aspect of whiteness. Whiteness is a much wider thing. It's much more deeply rooted than just being the fetish of some handfuls of terrorists who have been neurodamaged by being socialized by the PlayStations, you know. Whiteness is Al Gore, is Russell Brand, it's my mother. If you're watching this, it's probably your mother. The, the good-humored and sympathetic atheism of Stephen Fry is, in a sense, closer to the core of whiteness than those terrorists who cried to Valhalla before gunning down unarmed people in a mosque somewhere. And this is not to say that whiteness isn't a problem, it's just to say that it's a much, much broader and bigger and more deeply ingrained in us and much more contradiction-ridden and much more influential thing you know, and secluding it into identification with a couple of psychopaths with guns is not going to help us deal with the problematic sides of this, it, right? The important thing that I want to point out here is that whiteness is profoundly tied to modernity. And modernity rests on the idea that there is only mental capacity inside human minds and that the exterior world is dead. As the Norwegian philosopher Arne Johan Vetlesen pointed out in my conversation with him, our civilization acts this upon the world. Modernity's dead world is something that we do to the world, and that's why the world is literally dying, right? And this is the deep reason that animism is oppositional to whiteness. The real whiteness, you know, the broad whiteness, Stephen Fry's whiteness, the one that so many of us are, are all tied to somehow, right? Presenting your traditional animist knowledge to that whiteness, that spurs deep, deep counter-reactions. There are reactions of fear, gatekeeping, almost phobic rejection patterns, because whiteness has been built on the modern as oppositional to the traditional. And part of that opposition making is actually uh, imagery of fascism or thinking about fascism. So whiteness is complex. It's not a unilinear gradation. And then you have more and more and more whiteness. Here you have Stephen Fry with all his charming, respectful humanism. And because he's such a kind man, there's only little whiteness there. And here you have the Norwegian terrorist Anas being Breivik, who murdered 70 children in the name of whiteness. And then that is a lot of whiteness. It isn't like that. Whiteness is complex and filled with contradictions. And even in its deep, deep... Uh, uh, dependence on modernity, even those that think of themselves as, as white traditionalists and white nationalists, they are profoundly modern uh, because they're sometimes romanticists, longing for some older world is, uh, is defined by, it rests on the, uh, the modern rupturing of the world. Uh, and this has led some to identify romanticism as such and its critique of modernity with fascism. The Italian thinker Umberto Eco, he has this as the opening to um, characteristics that uh, describe what he calls ur-fascism, or proto-fascism, or essential fascism perhaps. The cult of tradition and the rejection of modernism, right? Which is, of course, absolute nonsense. 
as it would make any indigenous queer activist into an essential fascist, because everything uh, they do rests on valorizing, dialoguing with their tradition in critique of Euromodernity. Calling that fascism doesn't make any sense, right? European romanticists have indeed some, sometimes been huge murderous fascists historically, but European rationalist modernists have indeed also been gigantic murderous fascists. Euromodernists like Stephen Fry can indeed be uncompromisingly dedicated to kindness and humanism, while Euroromanticism, uh, Euroromanticists can be just as dedicated to kindness and respectful relations between people. The American School of Anthropology is a really good example of this. It's a very influential train of thinking that rests on a romanticist understanding of humanity. It was founded by Franz Boas, a German romanticist, who already in the uh, 19th century uh, championed notions of race that would basically work today and strongly countered the scientific racism of the day. And um, yeah, and th there are also other examples, by the way, of romanticist thinking being uh, very progressive. So the romanticist impulse and valorizing European tra tradition is not somehow essentially fascist. So, all right, you know, Umberto Eco is wrong and I'm right about this. It's not even particularly controversial. It's extremely evident, which is why it's so remarkable that this idea is so persistent. When people uphold irrationally paradoxical ideas, usually there's some underlying sort of cultural driver at the root of it. And in this case, it is this cultural reason behind this mythology, you could almost say, is upholding and reproducing whiteness as tied to modernity. Because since the Second World War, fascism has been the greatest marker of political evil in our age. So the reproduction of modern whiteness has just loved and cuddled into little bits and pieces the fact that fascist militarist movements sometimes tend to reduce Euro traditional motifs to stafash in their imagery. While the fact that they're also deeply involved with Christianity and with modernity, by the way, is totally overlooked and glossed over. So paradoxically, there's a fact that when fascists use, for instance, Nordic symbolisms, they're actually bolstering whiteness uh, or central cultural tenets in, in whiteness by themselves as an, uh, as an image of other, actually, and, and, and other, by the othering of these symbolisms. By using them, they place these motifs in a place that would make kind, decent people like Stephen Fry and probably most decent Euro descendants probably want to vomit, right? And this, so this contributes to the marginalization of Euro-animist tradition and it upholds white people as modern. Now, this places us today in some kind of a double bind, right? But, but let me just roll back a little bit to the old colonial oppressive language, which talks about the animists, such as the Dutes, as infantile, barbaric and delusional, right? Today, this oppressive language is being reproduced as the attempts to recover Euro-animism are most often seen as New Age silliness and fascist and still delusional, right? So you have New Age childishness, fascist barbarism and delusional. But here's the thing. The thing is that the New Age childishness and the fascist barbarism, they're actually there. These are two not entirely unimportant aspects of how your traditional knowledge is being practiced today. And I've actually wanted to make a video about the New Age part. And, uh, you know, also these two have, have recently been married in this so-called conspirituality interface where you suddenly have New Age hippies that are basically protesting together with Nazis in these, you know, weird sceneries. Um, and I believe that this is the root reason that your traditional knowledge is kept under the boot of these oppressive ideas. We are caught in or stuck in this double bind, a two front war. We have to fight the actual infantile barbarism uh, of new age silliness and fascism on the one hand, while fighting the overexposure of these aspects on the other, because the overexposure of these things is a colonial oppressive structure. How do you do that? How do you fight fascism without overexposing it, focusing on it almost, right? It's a paradox almost. And I think it is the impossibility of this fight, uh, which is at the root of why 
Euro traditional knowledge is still excluded as oppositional to modernity. So who cares, you might say, that some radical militarist groups in the Midwest uses Nordic symbolism? Why does the fact that some incredibly dorky white dudes like Vikings even merit our attentions? Um, well, perhaps it wouldn't if the global media hadn't chosen the fact that they do to become a main theme, right? Why, pray tell, would the global media choose exactly this clownish figure here as iconic of what is really an evangelist revival movement? It's absolutely absurd. Why exactly the image of the QAnon shaman, which has been seen all over the planet? Well, because this exotifying image builds on and affirms the stereotype aspects of Euro-traditionalism, uh, Euro it's infantile and barbaric. At the same time, bingo, he's perfect. He represents both New Age childishness and fascist bar barbarism in the same go. The focus of this sort of heathen animist looking figure with tattoos of Thor's hammers and Yggdrasil and stuff like that, that completely occludes the fact that the movement that he was a part of has zero to do with any heathen or animist uh, position. It is some ultra-nationalist retrograde Christian sect linked to the ongoing implementation of some kind of Saudi Arabian style theo theocratic evangelist totalitarianism in the US where people can't get abortions and shit, you know? So, the choice of this figure serves two purposes. It upholds the old marginalization of Euro-traditional knowledge as barbaric and infantile, and it exonerates Christianity from the implication in the ideology that in fact motivated this strongly evangelist-leaning movement that, uh, of this, this attempted coup by Trump followers on the American democratic institutions. Um, and, and I'm not saying that journalists are conscious about this. Of course they aren't. It's not like a conspiracy. They just choose exotifying imagery that they sense will appeal to pre-existing cultural sentiments, right? If, 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 they, if they choose something that, is, that breaks the image, then they need to explain that. And then that, that becomes a, a different story. So it's, it's, a, it's about ruptured perceptions as well that we don't have uh, we don't have the the mental capacity to um, understand uh, new things actually uh, because we we live in this kind of Twitter mind um, there, are, there are exceptions to this rule by the way in Denmark uh, perhaps surprisingly uh, in the last year the national TV has had a whole number of TV programs that has have portrayed contemporary Nordic religion very loyally and with real people, um, generally without these uh, stereotyping uh, motifs. But this is a rather new tendency. And, uh, you know, it used to be the same here. Uh, the media here used to focus on the outlandish, the grotesque and the infantile, where I, I think that the Anglosphere uh, seems to focus a little bit more on the barbarism and the fascism. So, yeah, this is the current version of that language that you find with this folklorist Henning Feilberg that I mentioned in the in the beginning who talks about the Jute peasants as animist savages and infantile hysteria um, uh, you know and delusional mental deviations and all that stuff um, but because I have sort of assertively taken the position of Euro traditional animism I then experience this rejection actually quite a lot Often when you bring this to people, then they reject it right off the bat. This combination of the infantile and barbarism of new age and fascist, understandably actually quite make people go like, like that, you know, uh, right away. And uh, the more I've reflected on it, the more I find this to be a serious problem. Keeping your descendants encased in modernity is a really bad plan. You know? So while we keep up animist critiques, of nationalist projects and nationalist mining of our heritage and maintain, of course, staunchly anti-racist positions, we also need media to take responsibility for not overexposing these links and then making that a lever for the continued marginalization and oppression of our traditional knowledge. You know, I don't know, perhaps media responsibility is a contradiction in terms, but you know, no, you know, no. Take a look at those programs from, from Denmark, for instance. You can probably find them somewhere on the internet. They're super popular, 
easy produced, kind of low budget, you know, television created to entertain basically, but they talk about Euro traditional animisms in non judgmental and non exotifying ways. It's not that difficult to not sink people into degenerate stereotypes, right? Euro traditional knowledge is a topic with a huge potential for popularization. Tell the story, you know? The recovery of Euro animism is filled with amazing potential for popularizing. And it gets more interesting if you avoid just taking these clickbaity, exotifying setup as the starting point of your portrayal, right? So, whoever you are, uh, please collaborate on making our traditional ecological knowledge available again to uh, your descendants, particularly if you're indigenous or into indigenous scholarship. You know, I've tried quite a lot to contact different indigenous voices and podcasts, platforms, and so on, and I've gotten a lot of that, you know, indigenous silent treatment back. And I understand. Like, why should this white dude be giving a plat given a platform to speak? But in this case, it's actually really important. There are good reasons, you know. It is important to everybody. Fucked up white people is just a bad, bad idea, you know. So working to clear a path out of the fuck up, that's important for everybody. The ongoing cultural encasing of these 2.3 billion Euro descendants outside of contact with their traditional knowledge, it has catastrophic impact on the world. And actually, I also think that these things are connected. I think the oppression of colonized people's uh, indigenous knowledge is linked to or perhaps even predicated on the oppression of the traditional knowledge or indigenous knowledge of majority populations. You know? um, but this is also another issue which points a bit beyond this video here. So let's roll up our sleeves and get into this difficult conceptual two-front war. Let's get out of this double bind. We need to fight whiteness and fascism and racism on the one hand, but we also need to resist the overexposure of these things uh, as a tool to marginalize Euroanimism. Thanks for listening and see you around. Ben.